Hello everyone, I'm Thomas and welcome to my channel where I educate people on IoT and web development by showing how to build projects step by step. For more content like this, make sure you subscribe so you'll be first in line when it comes to the channel updates and new videos. And now, let me tell you what we're gonna be building today. So the plan is to make a user management API that uses AWS S3 files as a data storage. So basically, we're gonna build a set of Lambda functions with permissions to manipulate S3 files on AWS. And we're gonna put this Lambda functions behind API gateway with serverless framework to speed this whole thing up. So yeah, let's switch to the code. I'm gonna show you how to do this. So here I am on my computer. And before we get started, I'm just gonna quickly go through the main objective of this tutorial, okay? So the main objective essentially is to build an API, user management API, that is going to manipulate S3 files. Uh, the way it's gonna manipulate the files is by storing the data. Okay, so it's going to just, you know, you will be able to create user, modify user or get user, and S3, AWS S3, is going to act as a data storage instead of database, okay? And uh, the way we're going to store the data there is in a form of a JSON files, okay? So let me show you, uh, let me just quickly tell you an example. When you create a user using the POST method and you send a JSON request body, right? Then that Lambda function is going to generate a random UUID, right? So it's just gonna be sort of random hash and it's going to create a JSON file named after this hash with a JSON uh, property, right? UID, which is the same. And then it's going to put all the data that you sent in the request body, right? So if you send the request body uh, in the form of a JSON, obviously it has to be JSON and there's gonna be name John, surname Doe and role admin, then um, it's just going to create this file after the random hash and it's going to put exactly this content of the file, right? It's gonna write to the file this content. So that's essentially the goal. And, you know, obviously it's not just gonna be the post, there's gonna be a possibility to modify the existing user, the existing file on S3, and to get the user as well, which is just reading the data, right? So we'll be able to do it by UID, right? So once the UID is known, which is gonna happen after you do the post, you can get the user data using the get method, get HTTP method on the user endpoint, okay? So that's the, the main goal. And uh, how we're going to achieve this is uh, through serverless framework, okay? So we're going to build three Lambda functions and uh, with the use of serverless framework, I'm going to show you how to quickly and easy uh, deploy all of this, essentially build and then deploy all of this, okay? So so yeah, so that's, that's the, the main objective. Um, and now I'm going to move to requirements because like, you know, before I write any comments or code, uh, I need to go through this. So what we're gonna need is AWS account, AWS admin I am user, command line interface installed and configured on your machine, latest Node.js and serverless framework also installed on, on your machine, right? Um, actually, this is why we need Node.js because serverless framework has been written in Node.js and it uses Node.js to uh, deploy on the infrastructure and the code, okay? And uh, um, one important thing, if you don't know how to do all of those, um, have a look at the description of the video because I've already covered this in my previous video about serverless. There is also a blog article about that, getting started with AWS Lambda and serverless framework. So if you haven't done, if you're new to serverless framework, I strongly recommend you uh, have a look at uh, either the, the article or the video tutorial on my YouTube channel. Okay, cool. So the introduction done, and now we're going to start, right? 
And in order to start, the first step is to create an S3 bucket. Let me show you quickly how to do this, because this is just mother of using AWS CLI. Okay, so here is the command. Um, however, this is the actual one that I'm going to copy from here and paste into my terminal. And I'm going to create it, just run the command, right? But I've got an error, okay? I've got an error. The reason is because I've already have this bucket created. So for you, probably, if you pick the right name, right? So it's not the name used already, like taken already on AWS S3. That's something to note because the names of the bucket are shared between all of the users on AWS. So there is no namespace. It's just all the users. So you might actually get this message. That essentially means is either you already created this bucket or if you haven't, that means the other user created it and that bucket name is taken. So here, right, to fix that, that error, you need to change the bucket name. And actually I'm gonna do it just for the sake of demonstration. Um, yeah, again, I like I said, the reason it's already taken is because I have created it. But yeah, let me show you what happens if I just pick a different name. So I'm gonna press enter, and there we go. Right? This is this is essentially the success message here. Right? It might happen for you. It might not. It depends how you configured your CLI. But um, at the moment, it's not really possible to type any other command. So what we need to do is to press Q on the keyboard, and that's gonna take us back to the, the previous view on the console. And uh, now to double check, we have the bucket created. What we can do is to run AWS S3 LS. I'm gonna use grep here because I've got some, uh, I've got actually a lot of buckets created on my account. So yeah, as you can see, I've got the bucket, the one that I couldn't create at the beginning because it's been already there. And I've got two additional ones um, along with the one I've just created. Okay, so that's that's it for, for the bucket creation, right? If you now log into your AWS console right from your browser, you should see the bucket in there if you go to AWS S3. But yeah, I'm not really going to do it because yeah, I'm, I'm going to leave it to you if you are interested in that. So yeah, so that's the first step. Um, there is one thing to note before I go to the next step. It is on the region, okay? This is on the region. So region here, it is recommended to use the same one with the Lambda function, but yeah, we're gonna do it when uh, we configure the serverless.yaml, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna mention it again. Cool, okay. Right, so the next step is to create TypeScript serverless project from the template. And uh, for that template, we're not gonna use the official one, but the one I have created. And the reason is, the official TypeScript template is a bit complicated. Um, it uses Webpack and uh, it enforces a very specific directory structure in the project. And that's something I don't really like personally. It is too complicated. I'd rather, uh, I'd rather like uh, to have something uh, simple. So I created the simplest possible using the, the TypeScript serverless TypeScript plugin that is zero config. A template and I'm gonna show you uh, how this looks like so uh, let me just follow the steps in there so I'm gonna change the directory to projects and here after copy paste of this command right in the my s3 lambda function directory I will have my project created okay should be already there. Don't worry about uh, this message in here. This is how it uh, how it this is how this works uh, essentially if you use your own template. Okay, so now I've got this created. I can open that folder, which is my S3 Lambda function with Visual Studio Code. So that's this one, my S3 Lambda function. I'm gonna open it. And there we go. There we go. This is the project. And uh, as you can see, what we've got in here, let me just quickly go through it. We've got the prettier RC configuration. So maybe I will start from prettier. That is going to take care of auto formatting. Okay. Auto formatting of our code. So um, I usually do it with all the projects I create with Visual Studio Code. 
in TypeScript, JavaScript, and actually other, other programming languages as well. So um, let me just quickly do it. Uh, one thing, make sure you have a prettier extension installed. Um, you can find it here in the in the extensions. So, so there is a prettier. Make sure you've got it installed, and then what you're gonna have to do is to go to um, Code Preferences Settings, and then Type Format. Switch to the Workspace, and for the default formatter, we want to go for the prettier. So that's the first option. We want to uh, check uh, format on paste and format on save. Okay, now we can close the settings. But because Prettier is not installed yet, I'm gonna have to go to the terminal. Which is uh, also, by the way, required step for working with the template. Right? You, you, you don't see node modules uh, folder here, right? We, we have to install all of the modules from the package JSON. It is important. So you can do yarn install or npm install depending on uh, what package manager you would like to work with. They both support it with my template. So I'm just running yarn install. Okay, done. Right. So that apart, you know, from the from the dev dependencies, like prettier, for example, right? that I'm gonna configure in a second. There's also serverless, the plugin, and all the other required dependencies to get started with uh, TypeScript and AWS Lambda with serverless framework, okay? So now having all of these modules installed, I can go to uh, View, Command Palette, and then Reload Window. That's what you, you can type Reload Window if it doesn't appear at the beginning. And once you do that, when you go to a TypeScript file, you should have auto formatting configured. So basically, if I just type something like this here and save, then what's going to happen is that everything is going to auto format, right? So that was for the prettier configuration. It's going to be very useful once I start implementation, right? So yeah, um, on the directory structure, you've just seen handlers.ts is where we have an example handler called hello. And uh, that's going to be the second step. First, we're going to look at the serverless.yaml, right? So these are the only two files we're going to be modifying today, serverless.yaml and handlers.ts. Serverless.yaml is infrastructure, handlers.ts is the implementation, is the code, right? But yeah, I'm going to start from the infrastructure. So quickly going through the serverless YAML, this is where you define all your Lambda configuration and all the infrastructure, all the roles, permissions to your Lambda functions and so on. So um, yeah, it all starts with the service name that's been named after the path specified when we created the project on the template. Feel free to change it if you like. Um, that's going to appear as a prefix on AWS once we deploy the Lambda. Then we have a bunch of other settings. And what we're going to look at first is the region. Okay, so I'm going to remove those two commented outlines and I'm going to uncomment the region because something I've already mentioned, right? I used a different region. I use it because I'm based in Europe. So I used EU West 1. And that's also the one I'm going to use for the serverless.yaml, right? If you use US is the default one for the US, you don't need to actually uncomment this because that's going to be the default one. Okay, so the region's done. Um, yeah, one more thing on the region. So basically, a region is the physical location of the servers, of the AWS servers where your code is going to be deployed to and where it's going to be executed, right? Uh, so yeah. Serverless doesn't mean there are no servers. There are servers, but you don't have to care about those servers. It's going to be all done by AWS. That's, that's something to remind. Anyway, we've got a region covered. And now we're going to look at the functions, right? Uh, the most important section in serverless.yaml fi serverless file, where we're going to define all the Lambda functions. This time it's not just single function. We have multiple functions as I showed you here, 
right? But I'm, I'm going to show you, um, actually, it's going to be easier if we go just to the functions in here, right? We've got three functions, get user, post user, put user, okay? Let me actually copy this from here, so it's going to be easier. And I'm going to go through it, explain what this code does. I don't need all of this commented out code in here. Nice, okay. So yeah, so I've defined three functions. I removed the default hello one, right? Because we're not gonna use it. So three different functions, get user, post user, put user. They, po they, 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 they point to a different functions in the handler's file, right? So we've got a path to the handler, right? That is SRC, which is the directory where the handler's file is located. And then we, we've got the function name, okay? Get user, post user, and put user. At the moment, as I showed you a few seconds before, um, there is only hello, a function exported, right? In the handlers.ts. So uh, having all of this configuration in serverless.yaml, uh, forces us actually to to change that, right? So, we, so, we, so we're gonna need to add two more functions in here and rename hello to uh, something from here. But yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna do it later. So yeah. Anyway, this points to get user. That's gonna point to post user and put user, and then the event that invokes the lambda function, right? Because with the handler, we're just gonna have a function on its own. Um, we need something that invokes the function. And this is how you do it using API Gateway, right? You use the events, HTTP event. And that event essentially defines an endpoint in API Gateway to call the Lambda function, right? When a certain path, certain endpoint, right, is requested from HTTP client. So it can be browser or other HTTP client. And essentially for the get user, we expect the path to be slash user slash UUID, which is a custom parameter, right? The HTTP method is supposed to be get. What does it mean the UUID as a, as a custom uh, path parameter? It's basically, let me just show you an example. So imagine we making, we have a HTTP client and we're making a request. And uh, we're going to have something like HTTPS and there's going to be some sort of API uh, gateway URL, right? It's going to be auto-generated once we deploy. And then we're going to do slash user. If we do a get HTTP request just to the user endpoint, that's not going to work. We, we're going to get a bad gateway probably or 500. That is because custom path parameter is required. So what we need to do instead is to provide here some random hash, right? And that random hash, like once you provide it, whatever it is, uh, that, that's essentially going to execute the Lambda function. And then it's going to be up to the Lambda function to uh, check if that particular user with this particular UID exists, right? So this is, this is how it works. So that is gonna work. I mean, that's gonna execute function, but if you do something like this, that is not gonna work, right? And the same applies for the put user, as you can see here, to modify existing user, we also need to provide UUID. For the post user, we don't know what the UUID is because we creating the user, right? That's the first step. And that's why we just have a path user. So if you do slash user post, then this is gonna work. It's actually gonna respond with, I mean, not now once we implement the solution, but it's gonna uh, return the, the response body with the UUID. Uh, but yeah, we will see it in a second once we have the implementation done. Okay, so these are the functions, but that's not all because with the functions, we can essentially execute the code, right? We can execute Lambda functions, but we don't have access to S3 to S3 files to any bucket because AWS as a default implements zero trust policy. What does it mean? That means again, as a default, your Lambda functions don't have access to any AWS resource. There are like few default roles that allow for like sending the logs to the, to the cloud uh, watch and so on, but you don't have access. Those functions don't have access to S3 bucket. So we're going to need to give that access explicitly 
in serverless.yaml. And even if you did it the you know normal way, just clicking everything on a point and clicking everything on AWS console, you would still have to create these roles. But you know, serverless framework simplifies this process because what we've got is the IAM role statement section that we can simply provide. Let me just uncomment this one. This is like an example one, but just make sure IAM role statements is also under the provider in here, otherwise it's not gonna work. And uh, here actually we've got two example role statements. The first one is to the list bucket on a specific resource. The second one is a to put object. Okay. Um, but I'm actually what I'm going to do is to replace that with something I've already got in here. It's going to be easier to explain because we want to run those roles, define uh, these uh, permissions to our specific S3 bucket. Okay. So yeah, so quickly going through the, through the roles. So that all starts from the effect that is usually 99% of the cases is allow. I actually haven't seen myself something else in here. What does it mean? That means we allow for these two actions to be performed from the Lambda functions, all the functions, right? In the several as YAML, defined in the several as YAML file to perform them on a specific resource with a specific ARN. ARN is a unique address to an AWS resource. And in this case, that AWS resource is a, a Thomas example S3 bucket, which is on S3, right? But let me explain what get object and put object is because it's a bit different, right? Uh, to, to like to the normal fire system, right? In AWS, uh, Terminology get object means just, you know, read the file. So there's just access to read the file contents. Put object is essentially to write the file, right? So you can create a new one, but you can also modify the existing ones, like overwrite them. And uh, um, this magic F and join keyword here, because yeah, you, you might ask, what does it mean? That essentially is a specific, like serverless, and cloud formation specific function that does the string concatenation, right? So like in a YAM format, whatever you put in here, right? Using the hypens, it's gonna be concatenated. So whatever I put like here, it's gonna be just merged into one, except for this ref here. So it's just gonna be anything that is on the right hand side. Okay, this ref here actually is not required. Maybe I just remove it. So we'll talk about this when it's time. I'm actually not sure if it was uh, correct. So yeah, let's let's have it like like it is right now. So yes, essentially, um, just to explain what this fn join is going to produce, it's gonna be something like that: arn, aws s3, three columns, and then it's gonna be Thomas example s3 bucket slash and uh, star sign right so that's that's essentially the value of the resource and that points to our s3 bucket to any object to any file that's why we have a star sign in here um, why it is done like that is because aws forces you to be as specific as possible and uh, in case of get object and put object, um, this specificity is um, down to the single file name, right? Or the file pattern. And because I use the star sign, that means you have access to get object and put object on any files, any objects on this Thomas example S3 bucket. And that's why I've got a star sign, right? And the uh, second, role statement, right? So this is one, it's all collection, right? And there is a second one is to list bucket. And the resource here is a bit different, right? We don't have a star sign. That is because list bucket, the most specific 
subject here is a bucket, right? It's not on the file, it's on the bucket, right? Because you list entire bucket. And that's why it ends on the example S3 bucket. You might ask why we need uh, to list a bucket. We don't have actually an endpoint that lists all the files. Um, uh, the, the thing is, it is required to get uh, not found or no such key on a file that doesn't exist. Because like if you if you if you don't use this one, you will get forbidden as like a default response, and uh, using list bucket that fixes the issue, so we will get uh, 404, and uh, we will know when we should return 404 for a specific user that doesn't exist. Okay, so these are the role statements. Um, we just need uh, those two, nothing else. That gives all the access to our Lambda functions to be able to manipulate the files on S3. Okay, so the infrastructure part is done now. And now I'm going to switch to the codes. I'm going to open handlers.ts and uh, here we need to implement three functions, right? According to the functions we defined here in the infrastructure section, we need get user. So I'm going to start actually from this one. Rename hello to get user. And uh, we need to implement it to first of all extract UID from the path params. So we'll need to read event, but it's going to be easy with TypeScript. And um, then after that, we need to validate if the file, right, with this specific UID exists on S3. And if it does, we're going to read the file and uh, return the contents in the response body. The, the HTTP code status that we're going to return is going to be 200. But if the file doesn't exist, we need to ret return 404 not found. And also we need to handle other errors, right? So if something other bad happens, we want to maybe return 500, right? Eternal server error, right? So I need to cover all of these uh, cases, right? So first of all, UID, this is required to get, to construct the file name that we're going to use to check if the file exists on S3, right? So UID, this is pretty straightforward. Actually, we just need to use an event. And um, on the event, we have a path parameters member, right? And path parameters will have UUID. There is one requirement though, uh, which is this exclamation mark here. That means in case there is no path parameters, that's going to return undefined. Okay. Because it might not be there. It should be there because we did the infrastructure in a way that is there, but we can never be sure. So it might be undefined. I think it's undefined or yeah, it's undefined. Okay. So, that, so this Visual Studio Code uh, actually uh, gives us a, a, a definition of the, the, the type, right? So it's string or undefined. And because it might be undefined, I think it's a good idea to handle this, right? So if UID is undefined, then we're going to return status code. 400, that is bad request, right? UID is required. And for the body, let's just do something like JSON stringify, and there's going to be error and uh, missing, missing UUID. Okay, something like that. Right, so that's the fir first possible error. Now, the second, the second step here is going to be validate if the file exists, okay? And for that, we actually need to access S3 somehow. This is all possible, pretty straightforward, thanks to AWS SDK that is already part of this template. So what we need to do is to create here S3 that's going to be auto imported from AWS SDK. Let's give it a few seconds and there we go. So we, we will get, this is a, a service object for S3. It's got a bunch of methods. 
I've put the link in the description of the video to documentation. You can have a look if you're interested. Um, you, can, you can do pretty much everything. However, for the certain methods, you may need to give a different permissions to your Lambda functions in serverless.yaml, right? With the permissions we've got, we can do put object, most of the uh, methods here, or maybe not actually. Yeah, some of them, they require a specific one here, but essentially we can do put object, we can do get object, we can do a head object as well, and that that's the one, that's the one that's gonna tell us if the file exists, okay? So if I do something like await s3 dot head object, then as a parameters here, as an argument, I need to provide uh, an object with the bucket. So that's gonna be the bucket name and the key. And that key is going to be UUID dot json right so the uid that we read from the path parameters and we add the json extension to it right for the bucket let me just copy paste the bucket name okay from here so that's gonna be the bucket and head object however if you want to use async await syntax you need to run promise method. This is a AWS, uh, AWS SDK specific method. Um, on, on all of the methods, actually, um, you, you have this, this promise that turns the, the return object of the, of the, of this method, right? Of any method into a promise, right? So you can do a wait. Right, and uh, because we don't actually need to read anything from the head object, we're not really interested in any of the file metadata. We only care if that operation is successful, because if it's not successful, that promise is going to reject. Because we're using async await, that's gonna throw an error, right? And that error has a specific code. And if that code, is not found or in some cases no such key actually don't remember which one is the the, the correct one so we're gonna go for, for both if it's this one or this one that means the file doesn't exist right so that uid that's been provided must be incorrect and if it's incorrect what you want to do is to return a status code 404 and some error message that tells us maybe something like user not found, right? Because that user cannot be found. We cannot read the user data. Cool, okay, but yeah, what to do if the error is different? If the error is different, I'm just going to return a status code 500 and we, as an error, as a body, right, as a body, we're going to return something like uh, error, error message. So we will get the message from, from the AWS error, right? From here, right? So that is uh, the negative scenarios, right? The negative paths of the get user function. The first one is 400 if the UID doesn't exist, that shouldn't actually happen, but if someone changes infrastructure, it might then checking for the existence of the file on S3, right? If it doesn't exist, this is what happens. And if it's successful, if it's successful, finally, we can read the contents of the file. To read the contents of the file, this is again S3 service object, but this time is going to be get object, right? It's actually the same name, as the name of the action in the in the role statements and the parameters that we need to pass to get objects are exactly the same so it's again it's a bucket and that's the key which is gonna be exactly the same one uid.json 
and the bucket needs to be this one. So yeah, let me actually refactor this so we won't have a duplication here. I'm going to extract it to a constant in a module scope, right? So we're going to have something like a bucket name, right? Extracted in here. And now I can just use bucket name. Nice. Okay. Right. Because we're doing, again, a promise approach with, with async await. This is how we want to call it. And uh, this operation essentially is going to read uh, the body for us. It's actually already there in the output right after running this operation. And uh, we can simply return it. Let me just show you how this is going to look like. So we will have st status code of 200 and the body is just going to be output dot body and we can do two string on it two string and there is an issue here string or undefined okay yeah because of this question mark in here um yeah essentially body can be undefined in some cases so um ideally we just handle it in this way, right? So it's gonna we're gonna return an empty body if there is no body on the file that we uh, that we that we read here. Okay, cool. Okay, so that was for the get user. We've got this covered. Nice. Right. That should actually do its job. And uh, yeah, we have all the cases handled. Nice. Okay. Let's implement the second one. Uh, maybe the post user. So we won't need to extract the UID. So I'm just going to copy this bit, paste it here and change that to post user. Okay. Yeah. For the post user, it's going to be a bit different, right? Because like UID here, this can be extracted for the path from the path parameters. For the post user, the endpoint is just user, right? That's the moment where we need to create some random hash. And for that, I'm thinking about using UUID v4 format, which is something like that. Should look something like that, okay? Like the example at the beginning of, uh, of the article where, where I showed you the, the goal of this tutorial, okay? But yeah, UUID requires an external node module, an external library. It's called UID actually. So we're going to install it right now. So I'm going to open the terminal and in the terminal, I'm going to add UUID, yarn add UID, or you can do npm install UUID. So that'd be first step. And because we're using TypeScript and I know that there are no built-in type definitions for UUID, we're going to have to install types slash UUID as well. So I'm adding it. Actually, that should be added as a dev dependency like that. But yeah, I, I fix that later. Anyway, go for the dev dependency instead. Okay, cool. Okay, so we've got that. And now we can essentially use v4 function that's going to be auto imported. If you have configured your Visual Studio code as I have, that should be auto imported from UUID as a v4. So that just generates that hash I was talking about. So that'd be the first step. Now the second step is to essentially we need to read the body, but reading the body it's pretty straightforward with, uh, with the Lambda. It's on the event, under event body, right? So if you do event.body, that's it. That's how it looks like. So we can just access it like that. So we can actually move to the next step. And the next step is going to be running S3 put object, right? Put object. This is the method that takes, uh, let me just show you. It takes two arguments, uh, actually not two arguments, that's still params, right? So we still have params, but oh yeah, okay. So that's the difference, right? We have a bucket that stays the same. We have the key, 
which is also gonna stay sort of the same, right? But this time we generated UID, but that's just gonna be UID.json. But there is a, another parameter they want to pass, and this is the actual body. And that body can be our event body. However, because event body can be empty, we can do something like that, which is something I don't like. I'm going to fix it in a second and i tell you why I don't like it. Let me just finish this way that should be done. And uh, the reason I don't like this one is because that code at the moment is not going to verify if the request body is in a JSON format, okay? If it's not, that's still gonna accept it. And that's something I don't like it. I don't I don't really like. So instead of doing it this way, I'd rather define another another const variable and in here use a JSON dot parse where what I parse is the event body, right? In case it's null. That's something I allow for. So I'm gonna put just an empty, uh, just, you know, open and close uh, bracket. And that body is going to go in here, but it has to be stringified, right? So it's gonna be stringified back like this. Like this. It doesn't cover everything though. Let me just go back to the beginning, how I would like this to look like. There is something we have missing. Because at the moment, that will have a UID missing, right? If we just go with this approach. There's no UID. I mean, it's not guaranteed that the UID is going to be on the request body, okay? So what we're gonna do is to add it ourselves with the spread operator. So I'm gonna pass here an object, spread the body, right? So whatever is on the body, we're just going to add this to this object, and then we're going to add UID here. So this is how it's going to go to the file, right? This is how it's gonna be written to the file. And if this was successful, I'm just going to return status code 201, which is created, right? And the body here is going to be, um, that should actually be this one, right? That should be this one. So let me actually move this around. We will do instead maybe, because we, we want to return a body in here. This, this bit, okay? This bit, this, this, this is something we want to return because the user, the consumer of the API needs to know what is the UID of the newly created user, right? That's why this is, it's, it's the, the, some, some moving around needs to be done. Let me just do it. So I'm going to put this body, that's going to be our object. We're going to spread the result of the JSON parse and we're going to add UID here. It's going to make it easier. So now I can just run stringify on the body here and I can do essentially the same thing in here. Right. Cool. So that works, but it doesn't handle the error, right? It doesn't handle the errors. I mean, it would, it would return 500 with internal server error message, but I, I'd rather have a more meaningful message. So I'm going to put this entire block of code into try catch. Why this bit as well? Because JSON parse might fail when the event body is incorrect format, right? If it's in incorrect format, if it's not JSON, it's XML, for example, or plain text, right? And then we want this to fail. So that's what I'm gonna do. And I'm gonna catch the error. So basically, you know, in case this fails, or in case this fails, we will return status code 500 body 
json uh, stringify no we don't uh, yeah json stringify sorry stringify and we have something like error that is a message okay that's a message here if you'd like to i'm not really gonna do it now but if you'd like to you could handle the json error right because json throws a specific json parse throws a specific error if the event body if the you know the given parameter cannot be parsed we can catch it here and then return a different status code like uh, 400 pad request for example okay but yeah, i'm not i'm not really gonna be covering this because uh, i just want to finish this quickly don't want the video to be too long okay so that's the post user handled and now we're going to do a put user with some refactoring with some refactoring because of all the duplications that we have already so let's do the put user put user okay and first of all for put user this is going to behave slightly similar to get user because we need to extract uid first and that's the first point of duplication what we can do for that is to maybe define get uid function right that is going to retain this bit so essentially yeah i'm just gonna copy this paste it here return uid we're gonna have to take an event the same one that is passed to the functions And to not repeat ourselves with the error, right? I'm going to use uh, an error handling, right? So I'm gonna just use uh, throw catch. And the way I'm thinking about handling this is to define some sort of a class, an error class. So we have something like, um, let's call it maybe HTTP error http error that extends from the, the 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 default error right but the constructor is going to be slightly different it's gonna take the message that's fine message as a string but there's gonna be a second parameter that is a status code and that status code is gonna be number right so it's gonna run uh supper uh, on the with the message right so that's just gonna make sure the error stays the same but then right after that we will have something like uh, public read only status code that is a number and we essentially going to do something like a this a status code equals status code right because it's required yeah, that should that should essentially work, right? So that's gonna be HTTP error class, error class that we can throw in here if UID doesn't exist, HTTP error, and that's gonna be exactly the same message. So we'll have something like a, um, that is missing UID. And for the status code, we're just gonna do 400. We're gonna do 400. And this will be handled in the catch, right? That will be handled in the catch. But let me define a function for that maybe. Uh, is it a good point to define it? Oh, maybe not, not yet. Um, so what I can do um, here is to just run something like a if e instance of, and that's gonna be HTTP error. And then we're just gonna handle it like this. So we return status code that is e dot status code, right? We got the there and the message Sorry, the body is going to be JSON stringify with the error that is taken from the message, right? Something like that. So, so that's going to be our universal HTTP error class.
class, right? That we're going to throw whenever uh, something is wrong with HTTP. So that's the best approach, I think. So now I don't need that code. And even that code, I can essentially just do get UID, but I need to make sure this one is in the try catch uh, block, right? So as long as it is like that, it should be all fine. So that's all handled. Right, so now if I go to put user, I can do the try catch. and uh, read UUID using get UUID, right? Passing the event inside. But now we have another duplication that I need to get rid of, if you think about this, because we want to catch it in the same way. And uh, I don't want to copy paste this bit with the instance of, so instead I'm going to define a function. Maybe something like um, get error result, right? We could we could have something like a transform error result, but yeah, I think get get error result should be fine. So that would take an error, so there can be any error, and that uh, is supposed to return API Gateway Proxy result, right? It turns an error into API Gateway Proxy result, okay? And uh, um, how this is going to work is essentially based on this one, right? So we'll have, it checks the instance of the error. Uh, I think there is something I missed. Oh yeah, there is an arrow, okay? And uh, otherwise, if it's not a known error, if it's an unknown error, then I'm just going to return the status code 500 and uh, as a body, maybe we return a JSON stringify and that will be um, error dot, uh, maybe actually not like this. Let's stringify entire error object. So we'll get more information in case this is coming from from Lambda, from AWS, okay? So yeah, so get error result, actually it handles all of the HTTP errors and the unknown errors on top of it. So thanks to that, what I could do right now is get rid of this one, right? I can get rid of this one and uh, yeah, if it's not those two, don't need to do that anymore. I'm just going to do a return get error result and pass E there, right? For this, I'm going to handle that uh, in a second, uh, you will see. Okay, so that's that was easy, that was easy. Now, let's go back to put user, okay? Let's go back to put user. So here, if there is an error, we want to do get error result with E. That should be handled just fine. Okay, now the second step. Again, duplication, because what we want to do is to validate the existence of the UUD file, right? So we want to check if there is UUID.json file. That's already done in here. That's the head object, okay? Isn't it? There's a head object with the connection to not found no such key. So another part that we can extract in a separate method, a separate function, sorry, and just use it in both places, right? So let me call it validate user exists, maybe. That's what we want to check. Right, and this is going to be, that has to be a sync, right? That's gonna be asynchronous because of this bit, right, the head object. So it's gonna have to return a promise, but I'm going to make this promise void. Because that should just do nothing if it's fine, but throw an error if it's if it's not fine, right? So now I'm going to copy this bit. Okay, so this bit we need UID as a parameter. So let's take UID, let's string, and then
this bit has to be handled and turned into up error, right? So that's gonna simplify, I mean, the make, make, it's gonna make the code clearer, right? So if we put this into try catch, we do something like that, but instead of returning it in, in, in this format, what we will do is to throw a different type of error, right? That's going to be HTTP error. And that HTTP error as a message will have user not found. And the status code is going to be 404. And that's it. Otherwise, if it's a different type of error, we're just going to throw, re-throw it um, further, right? So this is going to make sure that the user exists, right? If it doesn't, then we throw it HTTP error that's going to get to the error result and then just return as an error, error response. Okay. So, so nice, right? So, uh, if we go to get user now, I just need to do validate user exists UID. That's it. But I need to await for this though, because it's asynchronous, isn't it? Okay. So validate user exist is done and we can paste the same copy, paste the same thing in here. So those two steps are just fine. Now the third step, and this is going to be another duplication because modifying the file looks exactly the same, like creating the file. You just use put object. Right, let's put objects. So essentially, we can do something like an upset operation, right? We can define again another function. Maybe let's call it upset user. So upset means you insert the new user, you create a new user if user doesn't exist, but if it does exist, then you overwrite it, right, with the new data. So let's do upset user. Uh, that has to be async. An upset user is going to take UID again. And then as a second parameter, uh, does it actually have to be UUID? I think it can just take an actual user, but we don't really have it defined, right? No, we don't have the user defined. We don't know what is the type of the user because it can be any type. So for that, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to define some a type, some interface. Let's call it user that extends from the object, but it has UUID that is string, right? The only one required member of this interface. And that's something we're going to operate on. That's something we're going to operate on. So what I can do in here, for example, is to put maybe user as a user in here, right? User as a user in here that we're going to require and that's going to do this operation for us. So what, what's going to happen is we run put object, right? Because put object is essentially something that, oh yeah, okay, UID. We could actually re, uh, read UID from the user, UID right? And we can um, return the body, but for that, yeah, we can just return the user, right? So that'd be just user. And that's it, right? So that will be, that will be upset user. And having all of this, I can essentially do something like that. So remove this put object from here and just do upset user with the body. And even more, I'm just thinking, I can move this part. I can move this part to upset user as well. So so we can actually make it return the user. Maybe that's easier. Yeah. And let's do promise user. So that's going to be the return type. But here we will take just the body. 
that is string or null, that's the same type that we get from the event, and UID, maybe UID is first. So let's do UID string, body string, or null, we'll get it like that. We call this user, and then that all stay as it is. But yeah, this one can be just UID, since we've got UID there, okay. So now that's going to be even better and we can return that user after all, right? So we have upset user and this, this could be even simplified in a way that we do await upset user at this point. We can just do UID and we can uh, pass the event body in here. So that's even less code, right? We could even actually do v4. That should be, uh, but you know what? I'm gonna keep UID for the sake of, of the code readability, okay? So that can be like that. And uh, having this convenient function called upset user, what I could do right now after validating the user exists would be to just run it, right? So we can do const user equals or even better, uh, or maybe, you know what, let's, let's continue doing this. So that be const user equals await upset user, UID that we retrieved from the path parameters and the body from the event body. And then just return that as 200 and JSON stringify that user, right? And not like that, like that. Okay, so that's the put user, okay? And there we go, there we go. We have all of this code done. There is some other refactoring uh, we could do. Um, for example, on, um, let me show you, on this bit, right? The key UID.json, there's lots of duplication about that. What we, what if we decide to change extension, right? It'd be too much duplication, but I'm not really going to go into this right now. You can have a look at the code from the article. This is um, the cleanest version I uh, have come up with. Of course, it could be refactored further. There is no ideal code, but yeah, here, um, it is in here, right? So you can have a look at this one. It's very similar to what I've just implemented. So yeah, we also have get user, but we also have a nice comment. So you can, you can go through it yourself, familiarize with this code and uh, even add something additional if you think it could be done better, right? If it actually could be done better, let me know in the comments uh, how do you see uh, this uh, working. Nice. Okay. So yeah, essentially, um, uh, this is it. This is it. That should work. And to prove that works, I'm going to deploy it. I'm going to deploy it and to deploy it, super simple, because we have the code, we have the implementation in here. We have the infrastructure done. So only thing I need to do is to run serverless deploy. When I press enter, that should create whole infrastructure, deploy all the code for me, unless I made a mistake in the serverless.yaml, which I'm not sure if I did. Let me check. Okay, there we go. So um, it is all deployed and we can see the endpoints here in the terminal. Now to test this endpoint, I'm just going to use curl, but uh, if it's more convenient for you, you can use postman. Um, it's a really nice tool uh, to be used. Maybe I do postman as well for you. So yeah, let, let's, let's just do with curl quickly and I do postman as well. So you will see how can you do this. Okay. So you're going to start from post. So I'm just going to do curl, curl x post. And we have something like this. 
but that was my previous Oh yeah, actually that's that's essentially the same. So yeah, let me just paste that URL and we should get the, yeah, we got the response back, right? So we have this UID for the new John Doe user, right? And now let's try to do a put, right? So I will modify it. I will modify it. So I'm gonna put a, a put in here. Let me just make it a bit bigger so you will see. Yeah, so that's gonna be put now. And we change the name maybe from John to Joe. Okay, let's change it to Joe. And uh, obviously we also have to add uh, that UID at the end because we're doing put, right? UID is required. I'm just gonna run it. And there we go. We got Joe Doe now, right? And now let's confirm Joe Doe is actually Joe Doe. So I'm gonna change that method to get and completely remove uh, this data section in here, okay? So there's not gonna be any data anymore. Just a get. And let's see what we get. There we go. We have Joe Doe from the from our api okay so that's pretty cool right that's how it works nice uh what happens if i use the incorrect one right so let me remove something change it to something else there we go we got error user not found right how do you do it in the postman in the postman you just need to open it let me just do it for you because yeah, lots of people use Postman. I, I usually do curl. If it's something simple, I do curl. But the yeah, Postman essentially is going to be slightly uh, easier in this case. Okay. So yeah, uh, there is lots of tabs I've got open in here now. Okay. So I'm going to open. I've just opened it here. And we're going to use the same, the same uh, URL, right? So that's going to be the base URL. Right, and I'm gonna do post, and uh, that's just gonna be slash user. That's it. For the body, I'm gonna pass some JSON. So what we're going to do is to pick the row JSON. Right, so that's gonna be JSON, and let's uh, let's maybe add a new user, uh, maybe Bob. Maybe Bob. Uh, do okay like this and now i'm going to send it as a post right there we go so that's the uid that we received and now if i open a new tab i paste this in here and i copy this bit and i just use a simple get right so we'll do that there we go right we got the bob do if I change that to put and add the body that is a JSON and let's copy this and maybe let's change this to maybe back to Joe, maybe Joe, Joe Doe 2 and maybe let's add another property, maybe admin true, something like this. Okay. And now we've got a put, so we're trying to modify it. And there we go, right? We have our John Doe, uh, Joe Doe 2. Gonna change the body to none and change the method back to get. And this is what we got, right? So our API is essentially working well. We can do all the endpoints. And uh, yeah, this is it. This is it. There is no more to uh, this uh, tutorial. If you followed my steps and you got similar results, that means you accomplished this tutorial and now you can build and deploy a simple API and, uh, and deploy it as a AWS a Lambda behind API Gateway. You can manipulate S3 files, you know about role statements and uh, um, all of this uh, 
that uh, we put as an objective, right, is, is now done. And this is it for today. Thanks for watching. If you like my content and you find it useful, don't forget to subscribe. Cheers, bye.